Wait. Go again. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, friends of all ages, and welcome back to the Regeneration Podcast. I'm Michael Martin, your co-host with my brother, Mike, Mike Sauter. What's up, Mike? Mike, I'm still playing with my microphone a little bit, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's uh, Advent season and something just seems to be unbalanced, but uh, if that's the worst of my problems, I'm having a pretty good day. That was intense, whatever that was. Yeah, Advent is an intense season, is it not? It is. Yeah, it always is intense, like Lent. Uh, so today we're here to talk to Mary Jo Oresti, who is, uh, what's your title at the association? Grand Pooba or something like that? Well, I used to be the Grand Pooba, yes, but okay. I have... I uh, recognize how things need to move along, and um, I am now a board member at the Association for Healing Education, and I do consulting and do some grant writing. And when you, you started that, Mary, almost so almost 40 years ago, wait a second, Mike, almost yes. 40 years ago you started that? Right. The association got rolling in the mid-80s. Yeah. So it had a very organic wow. uh, beginning. It started with conferences, mm -hmm. and then people said, "Well, gee, could we have a um, you know, like a theme now that we could develop?" And then out of that came a training and a board. So, so here's I'm going to share with our listeners a little story from back in the day. Um, so, has see, 1992 or so, maybe 91 where I started working at the Detroit Waldorf School uh, as an assistant. And at the same time, Mary Jo, who, who was teaching there, hired me as her gardener and then passed me off to her mother, who, whom I love. And I, I have fond, fond memories of, of working with, with, with Mary Jo's mom. And uh, the wonderful thing about my training as a Waldorf teacher is there was no teacher training in Detroit at the time. And the the teachers took it upon themselves to train me. And I think I, I probably received the best teacher training anybody could receive because I essentially did a practicum in every grade, including kindergarten. I wasn't a lead teacher, but I spent some time in kindergarten. I did a practicum in first and second grade. I did one in eighth grade. I did one in seventh grade. I did one in fifth grade and fourth grade. I went all the way through and it was wonderful. And part of what that training included is, and this is while I was working as an assistant, is that I would help Mary Jo in what is called the extra lesson. And I learned so much about teaching from Mary Jo and about child development. And one of the things, I just got to tell this story. So when I was years later, after I left Waldorf and I was teaching in college, uh, because they knew I had been a Waldorf teacher, they asked me to teach a couple uh, education courses, though I had never taken an education course in my life other than what that I, makes what you I a did. good teacher of education. Okay, that's course. that's pretty that didn't ruin me. Right. Yeah. But one of the things I would do with the students in this education course is something I learned from Mary Jo. I'd say, OK, everybody, uh, pretend you're looking through a telescope. So they pick up the telescope I said. All right, and pretend you hear something in the far distance and you put your hand up to your ear. So they would put their hands up to their ears. And now pretend you're throwing a ball and they would pretend they're throwing a ball. Pretend you're kicking and they would do all these things. And then I would go through the class that said dyslexia or something or diagnosed with dyslexia or this other kind of thing. And they're like, are you a wizard? How did you know all this stuff? I said, well, I... It's phenomenology 101. You just pay attention to how people are doing. And Mary Jo will, will tell us, you know, so much of, of her work and so much of what she got from this guy, Rudolf Steiner in the curative education course was, is just, you read that it's the, the most, it makes so much sense. Yeah. It's so commonsensical, but and there's nothing mysterious at it at all, but it's such a sound uh, human anthropology, especially about the incarnating child. And I learned so much from Mary Jo from doing this stuff. And 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 I love her to death. I love her to death so much that she is my second oldest son's godmother. Mm. And uh, 
and we we have a we we're we're like brother and sister. I have to say we're 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 close. So Mary Jo, welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. Welcome, Mary Jo. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is this is really great. I'm ha really happy that I can you know, talk about the work and talk about how it's common uh, with the work that you guys are doing too. So, um, you know, I just was listening to uh, Michael talk about this uh, capacity that you have to develop, I think, to be a good teacher, which is the capacity of observation. And uh, of course, you need to know what some of these things mean. Uh, but one really has to be has to begin with that. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking about a uh, lecture done by one of our presenters, uh, Dr. Ross Rentea in Chicago. And uh, the way he spoke about it, it uh, was that when we when we observe and we put ourselves into the place of the child, it's really almost like a meditation because you are really taking this internally in a quiet space and you're pushing yourself away, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can come to some kind of a therapy that is a, you know, for a particular need for that particular child. So uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, an extremely important part of the work. And um, I just wanted to tag on a little bit. I don't know how many folk from last week are here today, but uh, one of the things that came up in that podcast was about uh, Dorothy Day. And I just wanted to mention that my mom was one of the original Dorothy Day folk in New York, and I did get to meet Dorothy. Wow. And um, I met her when I was around nine years old. And that has actually informed a lot of the work that I do now. And I think that is because that barrier between you know, self and other is very thin or as much as you can eliminate it. And I think that's what also helped to me, you know, with the children and understanding what needed to, to happen is being able to put yourself um, in their shoes. Mary Jo, can I interject one thing here to say that like, uh, when we string together, you know, 30 some odd podcasts and so forth, regeneration, you know, when, uh, when we were talking about the grail with some people a few weeks ago, when we were talking about William Blake, a big word and the name of Michael's journal is the imagination, you know, and I, I think exactly what you're talking about that I always, you know, if there is a theme here and me working with young people themselves, like two things, I'm in a, a room here where I, you know, I've counseled students for 25 years or so. And again, like you talk to them and you talk to them and you kind of keep yourself silent. And what I would say before I knew any of this language is that the, the spiritual shape of what's ailing them kind of is in the room. You can kind of see it. Uh, but uh, furthermore, that what you're talking about, again, is the imagination, you know, and it's this fundamental power that is opposed to, again, is opposed to just thinking of superpowers and intergalactic travel and um, magic, you know, that this ability, the real magic is putting yourself into another person's place, you know, and I kind of want to keep on bringing the world, the word imagination back to what you're talking about. And then it goes through kind of like an hourglass. It goes through what feels like a compression, but then you see that is magic. That is intergalactic travel. That is a superpower and everything like that. You know, it's the fundamental gift of human being, you know, to quiet me and to see what it's like to be Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So it's this combination, I think, of what, at least it was in, in my work, uh, to be able to, ob you know, objectively look and then hold yourself back a little bit and let the, and then you let that imagination work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. out of and then out of that imagination, then you then you come to this picture of building a therapy or building a relationship, mm -hmm. you know. And this, you know, so, <clears throat> pardon me. And I have to say, this was so important, not just to my work as a Waldorf teacher, um, where you really where I like, and it was great because the first two years I was a teacher, I was mostly an assistant. So I got to do much more observation of this of the children than the actual teacher could do because the teacher is 
doing all the stuff a teacher does. But as I could watch the teacher and the children while, while the teacher was was doing her thing. And this one girl, I remember she was <laughs> she was writing in her main lesson book. And I said, I thought you were left-handed. Because, well, I am, but that hand's tired. And she was using the right hand. And I, so I went to the teacher who was a really wonderful teacher. Uh, I said, do you know she's ambidextrous? <laughs> she can use. And my son, Tommy, was is the same way. He, uh, he too, I thought he was left-handed. All of a sudden, he's using his right hand. He kept the hands tired, Dad. And it would, didn't look any different. Now, that's not usually what you see in students who have a problem in handedness. And I wonder, um, Mary Jo, if you could give us and especially our listeners, a kind of a brief overview of the incarnating child and the and what it is we work with as Walder of Teachers. I'd love it. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, uh, put simply, in, in Waldorf education and specifically, of course, in the ed support work that I was doing, uh, what we're trying to do is to help the physical body become a vessel for, you might say, the, the, the soul and the incarnating individuality. So if I'm just going to use my hand as a gesture here. If we think of this as being the physical body and also the chi or the energy body, and then here's the soul and, and the spirit of the child, you know, the spirit that goes through time and, and different incarnations. And what one would hope for is that it could go like this, right? A nice, easy, smooth fit. And you know, at, at night, of course, the soul goes out and, and the morning comes back in. But for a lot of folk, um, you know, it's not a equally spaced or smooth uh, vessel. It might be a little, you know, crinkle up. So when the soul spirit tries to come in, it can't quite do it. And that, and, and in that, shall we say, aggravation gets manifested as what people call learning challenges or learning disabilities or ADD or dyslexia or behavioral issues because the soul spirit just does not have that smooth entry. Right. So in education, we are trying to help this vessel become more stable and, shall we say, a better fit to the human archetype. Mm -hmm. At the same time, of course, you're educating the soul through the, you know, the pictures, the maths, the history, everything, you're educating the soul. Right. But it with the work that we were doing um, that Michael just spoke about is to get this vessel a little more clear. Now, uh, one of the um, disciplines that I work with was called Extra Lesson, and it was developed by a woman named Audrey McCallum. And Audrey was a Waldorf teacher. She did a lot of meditating on uh, Rudolf Steiner's work, came up with various exercises and I was privileged to be able to see how she developed these exercises over time. She had sketches and then diaries that uh, were the results of these exercises that she tried with the children and she, until she developed this body of work called the extra lesson. So um, I, th I think it'd be a good idea if I could just give you maybe one example of yeah, what do. she developed. So one example, was um, from um, some lectures from uh, 1909. And in it, uh, uh, Dr. Steiner talked about earth currents and how important it was um, to understand that these earth currents affected the human being and how we needed to align ourselves with them. Okay, so, uh, in this lecture, he spoke that we should think of the human being. Now, just try to imagine this. This is an imagination. This is a human being. Think of them as laying face down on the earth at the equator. Okay. 
face down on the earth at the equator with the arms spread out. Now, that person would follow, um, oh boy, I don't have the book here with me now. Ah, I'll have to go get it. Anyway, um, th that person's physical body has a response to those earth currents. Now, if you look at them, so now, so now just hold that picture for a minute. And now, uh, think of the earth currents. Oh, well, let's take the water. So water, as we as you may or may not know, but it's true if you look at maps and earth currents, you will see that at the equator, the earth currents move in a spiral formation so that they spiral in toward the equator. All right. So um, in other words, in the Southern hemisphere, they're moving counterclockwise. And in the Northern hemisphere, they're going clockwise. Like toilet water, right? Exactly. And literally you can, you can cross the, the line at the equator, go 10 feet and water will go down in a different direction. Wild, I mean, right, it's yeah. that explicit. It's really yeah. amazing. So, so we are connected to that. So how does that manifest? Well, your legs have the natural movement of a pretend, uh, pretending, um, so here's my right leg. My right leg will move like this from the hip. Now it's, it's not that exaggerated, but that is its natural movement. And, um, and the arms move in the other direction because, well, it's a long story, but, but, but they are freer from the earth currents. So a lot of children, when they get overstressed um, in some way or another, either physically or even emotionally, but usually physically because they haven't had the opportunity to go through the stages of development, right. um, they'll get reversed. Or, and they won't be in, in line with those earth currents. And then we start seeing things like clumsiness, behavioral issues, and all kinds of things. So, um, so I'm gonna hold this up for a minute here. Up a little bit higher, Mary Jo, a little bit higher. There you yeah, go. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so that is um, kind of looking at that, what, what, what I was just describing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the exercises that I would do would be based on those earth currents. Yeah. And, and it has to do with the movement of the feet. And just to tell you a little story, there, there's a really good one called the threefold spiral and it helps to really calm the children. And at one point I was the, sort of say the point person when the children who were really acting up that would send them to me. And I would do a combination of deep pressure, which is, um, uh, you know, touching the body very strongly, not really a massage, but to give the feeling of, you know, the child's boundary. This is me. This is not me. I'm in my skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of these exercises from Audrey, especially this one with the spiral. And uh, I mean, I have seen kids who have come in, you know, throwing chairs gone through 20 minutes of this, uh, I called it first aid for a bad day. <laughs> first aid for a bad day. And walk out shaking my hand, you know, mm -hmm. and thanking me. So it, they're very powerful. And this is all about making a vessel so that the higher self can come in and getting the child to breathe. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. And breathe, of course, is a <clears throat> multivalence type of breathing. <clears throat> And of course, the, the famous, at least I don't know it's famous, but it, it's famous in my head, the maxim of Waldorf education, that rhythm replaces strength. Right. So children, you know, will come in and they don't get math or whatever it happens to be, but rhythm replaces strength. And so, and things, so many things are done in a rhythmic way in Waldorf education, not just, not just in say teaching math skills or, you know, 
the multiplication table, but but the the structure of the day as well. Which and we live in in an extraordinarily arrhythmical uh, civilization right now. And one of the biggest problems for, for Waldorf teachers, and I know this. I mean, I haven't been a Waldorf teacher for sixteen years, but <laughs> I see it in college students too. Is that because of that arrhythmical existence not related to the to the seasons not related to the the turning of day and night not not related to anything in in the natural world um not only do feelings of anxiety arise which can't even be explained but um it, it well, it it disincarnates children or even college students or all of us, right? It, so you're not connected to your body. You're not connected to the earth. And because of that, um, you're, 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 uh, you know, you're open to all kinds of dreadful influences, not only uh, whether it's, you know, biological, chemical, or environmental or spiritual. And and the in the work in a Waldorf school is try, you know I said it's like you're just trying to create a, a healthy human being. That's the job here. It's not not getting somebody into Harvard. It's tr it's you're trying to help the incarnating child become human. Right. Yeah. I, I thought like, this is uh, a very interesting thought here because I think this, as you said, it's really an essential part of education uh, is, is to is to bring that child into that feeling that um, that they are in their body. You know, I tell you, I just shared down. Um, oh, I'm not going to quote correctly now. I know, but he said, "Well, you know, we are not these physical beings aiming to be spiritual. Actually, we are spiritual beings who are trying to become earthly." Mm -hmm. And and I don't think he you know he need, I don't think he meant that in a way where you know to be you know to be sensual or gluttonous or anything like that, mm -hmm. but just right. to get into into that physical body and, yeah. and to feel uh, tethered, you know, to feel tethered to the earth. And it's it's interesting. So with my my students in college, and it, when, when especially when I have a lot of. Uh, education majors in a class, I'll, I'll I'll pull out a lot lot of this stuff. But one of the things that has never occurred to them, uh, and this is a, one of the foundational insights of Rudolf Steiner when it comes to education, is the importance of of stages of dentition. So I'll say I'll ask the students. So, what are the stages when when do when do babies get teeth? Right? When do they lose them? When do the when do the twelve year molars come out? Or when do when what do they call them wisdom teeth? And all of these things correspond to, uh, as Rudolf Steiner would say, different uh, stages in incarnation of the soul. And I don't know if you want to talk about the sheaths, Mary Jo, but I think that that would be a good thing to mention here for for our audience. Yes. Um, right. Well, I mentioned this a little bit before about the. Um, you know, about the, the the this physical vessel, but there's a, there's another aspect here about how the um, higher self works through the soul and the life body and the physical. And um, one of the things Steiner talked about was called the constitutional types, and that is it's pedagogical. It's not therapeutic. But when you begin to understand a child through that point of view, you can, you can also come to some good interventions. So just to give you a, a little example, one of the descriptions was called the uh, fantasy rich child. And that doesn't mean that they have a big imagination. He, these are old words, okay, because he, mm -hmm. he was around a long time ago. But basically what it meant is that when a child got hold of an idea, got hold of a fantasy, then it was hard for them to let go. So that would be when that higher self um, um, is, is, having the, is having this challenge of coming into um, the soul life. And so uh, we'll just give you an example. I was working with a boy 
he, shall we say, he kind of fell into this description amongst other descriptions, because we don't, you know, I, we're not labeling here, we're just, you know, looking at te some tendencies. And um, uh, a fire truck came by and he got, a, he got afraid. And he said, oh, was it, is there a fire, is there a fire? And I said, I don't think so, because if there was a fire alarm would have come on. So we can kind of continue with our class. Five minutes later, well, I didn't hear the fire engine again. Maybe it's gone. Okay. Five minutes later. Well, uh, Mr. Zetner, he is our super. Mr. Zetner would have rung the alarm if there was a fire. You see what I'm saying? It was like mm -hmm. every, just could not let go of that idea. Well, for that kind of child, um, a, a Steiner spoke about, uh, well, how do you get them unstuck? You get them into the flow and then to give pedagogical, uh, oh, I, I wouldn't call them interventions, but um, a, a different uh, a pedagogical tools. So uh, you would give them challenging movements and flowing drawings and singing and such. And so with this child, I had him um, make his own circus. <laughs> So I gave him a lot of challenging movements. We got, you know, bean bags and balance boards and all these things, and we developed a whole program. And then we invited his parents to the circus, and you know, we made an invitation and all got all dressed up and everything. But it was it, it was and and really really pushed him and gave him a lot of things. And um, he eventually really moved away from that kind of obsession. Now you see, in psychological terms, he would have been called obsessive compulsive. But if you move away from that and you say, okay, well, what am I seeing? I'm seeing somebody who's stuck. So how do you get them to unstick? I mean, it's really very practical. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really quite simple. And I often tell people, you know, when I'm, when I'm giving a course, you know, the thing about getting the empathy, you know, you know, that phrase about walking in somebody else's shoes. Sure. Right. Well, I have them walk in their own shoes, but they put their right foot in their left shoe and their left foot in wait I say you know what I mean I don't forgot where I started on that but anyway so they're so they're walking around with the, with their uh, shoes on the opposite feet and you can hear them go oh ow you know <laughs> making all these comments like you know oh th this doesn't feel good I feel so out of balance this is really awkward you know and then and then I write down everything they say and then when we come back to our seats and I, I read it to them I said and that's how it feels to be in a body that's not properly aligned. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Steiner also say relevant to anxiety that like, I've used this for students a lot, um, that like if you're, if you're having a bout or let's say a panic attack, and I don't know if it would work in a panic attack, but I do suggest it. You might try writing with your off hand, you know, the, the amount of concentration that would take. Um, and that's always struck me as, you know, intuitively true. You know, with the monastery where I worked for many years, the abbot uh, was from India and he would graciously have, and another monk would have some college students and myself over for like book discussions. And I'll never forget a day when um, they, uh, the students were talking just about life and these two monks in kind of real time were starting to comprehend the levels of anxiety, you know, so a young girl was just saying what we know almost all young people today feel as she was just describing what a day was like, you know, that I wake up and I think it's going to be a bad day. And so that's going to manifest and all this stuff. And um, she wondered what she could do. And one of the monks said, yeah, I think your body will just give out eventually from underneath you. And you'll, you'll then just, and which is kind of true. Then the abbot who's from India, you know, just said, um, go get a shovel right now and start digging in the earth, right? You know, and both these, you know, the common sense wisdom that can come from many traditions are certainly funneling into these, you know, profound mm -hmm. insights. And what Steiner did was give them to, a, you know, more of an outsider than you, Mary, Joe, and Michael, you know, but I've read a fair amount. You know, it, he's, um, he's given these basic commonsensical things, you know, flesh, and he's systematizing them and uh, putting them in order. And it's exceedingly invaluable, you know, but in a pinch, you know, I'm not as well uh, introduced to these items as you and Michael, but, you know, once you read the notion that somebody who's dealing with anxiety might take up a pen with their offhand and write, it feels intuitively true. So I can offer that to people. A, it's not going to do any harm. 
and B, it's likely to do a heck of a lot of good. And that's one of the, the one of the brilliant things in the Waldorf curriculum that Steiner must have seen it coming. Uh, that all all the practical activities there that are included in this, which which are all healing at the same time, whether it's knitting or gardening or drawing or the, all the singing that goes on in a Waldorf school, all these things are are, are so rhythmic and, and they're so healing and they're so connected to real things. Mm-hmm. To to woodworking is a great thing that's taught in the middle school and in the high school in Waldorf education. So you're you're working with with real matter of the of the of the real earth. Now, the funny thing is, is when Steiner introduced this stuff in the 1920s, um, people were much more connected to the real world than that we are now. But he saw then how through industrialization, et cetera, they were becoming disconnected from the real world. And it was very uh, it was a great amount of foresight, I think, that Steiner had to, to keep that in there because that you can only imagine, um, especially the, when we went through these through the pandemic where children were, even in Waldorf schools, were learning in an online environment for God knows how long. Um, it's, you're, you're, and this is the word I always use, right? right? The real. They were disconnected from the real. Right, right. Dis- disconnected from and I what I loved about being a Waldorf teacher is it was this uh it was a, a a network of relationship I mean the relationship with this of the the teachers to each other the teachers to the students uh, and all of that to the curriculum which was, was so uh ingeniously devised by Rudolf Steiner with the the developing child in mind for instance, Mary Jo mentioned when she was nine years old and meeting Dorothy Day. In the third grade curriculum, I think one of the one of the most important things in, in the Waldorf School is the teaching of the Old Testament as as history and literature, you know, to students. Because why? Well, a lot of different reasons. One is this is the age what we call the nine ten change in Waldorf education, where suddenly children feel alienated. They feel like they were basically kicked out of the garden, right? And they st- that, then this is often where they, they, they start to realize, wait, my parents could die. I could die. And so one, one of the many, you know, one, one aspect of using the Old Testament stories is it gives an answer to that, right? It gives an answer, it gives a, a context. And, uh, and of course, part of that in that third grade curriculum is, uh, textiles are taught or clothing we can say and house building which is like once once you're exposed to the world oh no i've been kicked out of the garden what does what does it say in genesis what does god give them it doesn't say skins of animals it says coats of skin which you know which is if you know as far as i'm concerned (laughs) flesh you know but on the other hand you got to have to feel protected then you need because you because the vulnerability that comes with that kind of almost existential dread that does come up and also at that that that's the same age where children become suddenly uh, uh cognizant or even obsessed with time you know what time is it what time what time is my dad coming right and and so how do you answer that that the needs to that child and, and the curriculum does but in the work mary joe does it tries you know because if, if a child is and they're almost none of them are anymore but if the child is you know soundly constituted the curriculum can move, move in right it just swooshes in with with all of its therapeutic insights but if it's not then the work mary joe does become so much more important because you need to create that, ve- like Mary Jo said, the vessel that can receive the, the world or the education that, that it's being imparted to them. Let me right. add on to that as a question for Mary Jo, only if it connects with what you might have said, Mary Jo, is that um, Michael mentioned these nine year olds kind of becoming obsessed with time, like reified clock time, uh, that it's you know, something substantive and real. And uh, you know, they feel that they're working under this puppet master. You know, if you talk to anybody, I think between say 12 and 19, you say, how are you? And they're going to answer that question, which is kind of a big question with, I either had a productive 
or an unproductive day. And that's so wedded to clock time. Did Steiner, Michael knows, and other people who've listened to these series of podcasts know that you know, I think a lot of the recent work, and it went back, but in uh, brain hemispheric work, you know, and that the, the more masculine, the right brain is obsessed with reified clock time. Um, does Steiner, you know, I, I want to, all those things, Michael, that you were saying, they're true, but yet this, uh, this clock time thing seems to be peculiar to our age, you know, that very few people are escaping it. It, it seems to become more and more tyrannical. I just watched a favorite clip of mine from what I think is one of the greatest fantasy novels ever read, but it's The Last Unicorn. It means a lot to me. But in a similar moment, you know, they're just looking at a clock and there's a great passage in the book where they, you know, uh, in order to like move back into the garden, you know, you have to say, you know, that we, we once thought that hours were substantive things we could touch and grab and all these things. But then at this moment, the wizard just goes right through the clock. Um, but could you say a little bit about Steiner and Timer? Maybe he hasn't like singled that as much as I'm doing here. Uh, because it is a tyranny uh, everybody, not just young people, is living under right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really interesting question, Michael. I don't know of, of um, a, a things that were referred to time in, in that specific way, mm -hmm. but but I would, if I put it into a slightly broader context, you know, as, as Michael. Um, would say we've kind of lost the, the background of the rhythm. And so rather than watching a larger, more universal unfolding of time and being respectful of that, you know, you do this in the morning, you do that, you know, in the evening. And, and it is not so far away in our culture. Um, I, I am definitely gonna take myself when I say, um, as a child on Sunday, we went to grandma, we went to mass and we went to grandma's and there was no change. On Sunday, my father taught me to drive at the mall parking lot because malls were closed on Sundays. You know, there was a, a, there was a recognition of things needing to be kind of cyclical where there were pauses. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened really is that we have lost the pause. Mm -hmm. And the pause is where we integrate everything. Mm. Um, if you learn a Spanish, you know, if you're studying Spanish and rather than plugging along for an hour and a half, go for a half an hour and then go wash the dishes and then come back because it is in that quiet time that's integrated. When I do movement with the children, we move, move, or eurythmy, move, anything move, anything therapeutic, anything developmental, and then you pause. And this is not just in Waldorf education. This is in, well, just about every movement therapy that I've run across is that there yeah. has to be a pause for the integration. Isn't it funny? Like we think, and it's a very valuable book, but this Eckhart Tolle book on the power of now, you know, that's, that's a great thing. I know that for me, uh, yesterday as Catholics, we celebrated the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the Solemnity, and that for me, Mary, <laughs> as you know, this great symbolic power of time and the flowing nature of time as opposed to, again, the systematic chipping away of something, but also um, that whenever I say any Marian prayer, I'll be honest with you, the Hail Mary, whenever I use the word Mary, I think of the now, you know, the present moment. But I think, you know, we have to work on two fronts. You know, that rhythm one seems so far away to people. It feels like it would take us years to cultivate that. That, uh, you know, I have, and people have gotten back to me that it's helpful, you know, take a real Marian devotion. And whether it's the Memorare, the Salve, uh, the Salve Regina, uh, the Our Mother prayer, Michael, for what it's worth in the Hail mm -hmm. Mary. Yeah. You, know, you can constantly be calling, you know, into your, to precipitate the awareness of the now um, through Mary. But I think, it's almost like a stopgap. It's like a field hospital um, solution to what you guys are saying about the human, the development of life, which is these rhythms, you know, which I think are more important. Well, and I, that's the other thing where what, one of the great things I learned as a Waldorf teacher is the importance of the festivals, mm. right? And I don't know if that's still going on in a lot of Waldorf schools. <laughs> I've talked to a friend of mine whose children are in a Waldorf school and they said, no, nope, they don't do that. <laughs> they don't do the advent garden. Oh man, or Michaelmas? No, they don't do that anymore. Oh man, that's not cool. But uh, that was 
that told that was a strong message as first when I first be, started to be around Waldorf schools when I saw how the Christian year was celebrated and because and it's what's wonderful about Rudolf Steiner is uh he wasn't retreating to the, to a medieval past he would see and this is what everything he did even with a uh, biodynamic farming he wasn't retreating to to a past or but he was taking the the goodness of of civilization of of our our our, our inheritance and bringing it into the future or have actually having the future come toward it you know and i think and that's important and it, as mary joe knows i mean on those festival days at the waldorf school there is such a mood of joy and expectation and more importantly reverence that accompanies it that which st children don't get generally speaking in, can you describe in, that reverence mike you know because again for young people it's kind of a lachrymose uh, reverence right well no uh, yes yeah, it's, not, it's pietistic yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, now, right. so for instance uh when we celebrated michaelmas mm -hmm. we didn't just go celebrate michaelmas uh usually it would start with a story so the the, the students whether it was an upper school and lower school or all together would gather in the auditorium and one of the teachers would tell a story, not necessarily the story of St. Michael and the dragon, but certainly a, a story of Michaelic courage mm -hmm. in the face of evil, in the face of darkness. And you, it's interesting because when you're a Walter's teacher, I mean, you, you, you cultivate this on, on, a reg, on, on a rhythmic basis, this feeling of reverence in the classroom. I mean, and it's, but it's not uh, sanctimonious, right? Yeah, yeah. I, for instance, for one of the things that used to happen we could to me. talk I would, about a, like a true reverence and a false reverence, you know, because. Well, when I would tell the story of St. Francis yeah, yeah. in sixth grade, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and the children, I would tell the story about the Francis meeting the lepers or whatever happened. And the kids would be in tears because it was such a beautiful moment. And sometimes the teacher would be in tears as well. Right, ah, <laughs> got carried away with that one, <laughs> but but that's that's one example of this. But there are so many um, moments in a Waldorf school. Um, right now, you know, uh, it's Advent, so in an at least we used to have Advent wreaths in in the classroom, and you know, you write light the first candle of Advent, and we would sing the great uh, carol by Eleanor Farge and People Look East with my classes and if I didn't do it one year they go we didn't do the carol we got to bring it back and because what's great about Eleanor Fargin what an intuitive woman she was is that that carol goes through the kingdoms of nature in procession from 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 the mineral kingdom to the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom to the human kingdom and in a Waldorf school every you light the first candle and I even said it to my children and then my kids are getting older, but we lit we lit the candle the first day. So what's the first week of Advent? The week of the, the week of the stones. And then we lit the second candle this last Sunday. So what's the second week? The plants. So you know, the first week we would put a couple of crystals on, at our Advent wreath, and the second week we put pine cones or acorns or whatever. And this week will be the animal kingdom. So we'll see what what the kids come up with to, to place around there but that is an active kind of reverence and it's rhythmic and it's connected to the world it's well said right it's not <laughs> and it's very simple that's what it's beautiful about it. it's very simple anybody can do it but you have to come to that you know you have to cultivate it mm -hmm. and i'm talking right now not just to teachers but to parents to that that reverence is not something and I think children are naturally, and I know this is what I, one of the things I learned from Thomas Traherne, is children get it, and we typically educate them out of it. And children are naturally not just curious, but reverent in their approach to the world, and they and they thinking that they actually the world is intrinsically good, that creation is nature is intrinsically good, that. Their, their parents are intrinsically good, that, that, that God exists in the spiritual world is intrinsically good. And we're taught, our education actually brings us out of that understanding, at least in most cases.
you know, this is a, a, a very uh, challenging time, I think, for some people to connect to ritual. But yet at the same point, this is, to me, a real calling for the time. This is how I, I, I feel one can really help build community. And, you know, when people are, come together to consciously have a ritual or, or, or some kind of celebration that recognizes the changes in the earth even. I mean, th that is just so basic and so real and it's something you can see and it's happening and we feel it on a gut level, but it's connected to so many other higher things. And, and, and just even being able to, to build one's own uh, you know, with your community to, to build some kind of recognition of that, I, I think is a real, a real healing thing to do. And, you know, this is what, this is what folk, you know, have done, you know, for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, where communities came together, this is how they got through their grief. This is how they celebrated with a birth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is how they celebrated a kill so they could eat. And it was, and they they had rituals. Uh, we we knew that rituals is what helps to make uh, an, an inner kind of um, you know fabric or uh, in ourselves, so that we can uh, uh, you know so that the so that these things that come at at us from the world can kind of bounce off. Mm -hmm. This is that resilience you were talking about before, Mike, about some of the students and. Yeah people that you work with, right? This feeling of feeling vulnerable and traumatized and pressured. And, you know, so I, I think this is this whole business of, 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 of helping them find that inner part. How did you get into all this, Mary Jo? Um, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right so I I, a lot of people like you know how did anybody ever find rudolph well Schreiber? well what this is um, room, you know? this is one of those things where you feel like well the angels are working thank mm -hmm. you very much yeah, so, yeah. So i was at a friend's farm i was taking care of it while he was gone and i had horses and goats and you know the whole shebang and I, I, the one i managed to find some time i went into his library he had an exceedingly huge library and when i walked in um there uh, the window uh, shade was only open a little way and a shaft of light was shining in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over and it was a book on Eurythmy, which is a kind of um, very purposeful movement connected to sound and speech. Mm -hmm. And I opened it up and I started reading it and I went, dang, I've been looking for this my whole life because <laughs> I was, uh, I did a lot of dance. Yeah which I think is another reason why I connected to all this because it's very kinesthetic. And um, yeah, so uh, he came back and I said, what is this stuff, this, <laughs> yeah, this oh, yeah. Rydney Steiner stuff? And he said, well, you know, there's a, there's a Waldorf school right in Detroit. And I, and, uh, I signed up at, uh, right then for I'm class. I'm glad I asked the question. That's fascinating. Yeah, and here's an interesting thing, Mike. So, um, so what year was that about? Mary Jo? Oh. 75 well, or so? Uh, I have a very poor historical memory. So mm -hmm. I'm, right. I'm thinking here a bit, a bit like mid 1970s. I did a little bit and then moved to Texas. So just a, a few years after this, I was 18 and I had my first real job out of high school. I hadn't planned on going to college. And uh, this is besides being a musician. And uh, uh, we're at work. Where one of the places I what I did I drove a mail truck between uh, an office for the AMPT company and the the warehouses. So that was my my job. I drove in a circle all day. But where I where the office was was in Southfield, Michigan, right across the street from Dun Scotus Friary, which wow. was a and it was a beautiful church. I mean, one of the most beautiful churches I've ever seen, and we had beautiful grounds, and big woods like a pasture, and this beautiful oak tree, which I actually have a, a branch from in my room. And uh, there were these gardens there that were extraordinary in an apple orchard. Now, 
I found out when I became a Waldorf teacher that not only was all that extraordinary stuff going on, but that's what the Teacher Training Institute was. For, for, and that garden was actually built by by Alan York and my friend Mike Sieben Morgan. <laughs> and Alan York is the guy who kind of revolutionized the wine industry some 25 years ago. Um, if you if you want to see it in there, there's a film that came out a couple of years ago called uh, The Biggest Little Farm. And mm-hmm. Alan it was actually Alan dies halfway through the film. Spoiler alert. Wow. But but he was an important figure. And here all my friends, Mary Jo, all my former colleagues, were right, you know, a uh, hundred feet away from me inside the, the monastery while I was out there eating my lunch in, in, in the garden. Fascinating. And never met any of them until I finally I worked at a bookstore and I met met a couple of them and then I was hired as the, as the assistant and then it took a little while till I realized wow I was in this aura <laughs> this whole time you know talking about magic and yeah. talk, talking about your angels taking care of you you know because I had never planned on being a teacher uh huh right right um uh, I I'd like to just tell a little story, a short story about a student, if I may. And then I, I would feel really remiss if I didn't um, uh, talk about, uh, believe it or not, balance, but uh, in a physical way. So it, it, just about how things come to us and uh, destiny-wise. Um, when I first started teaching, I had three children who could not read. I was tutoring them. We were not getting very far. One of them had one of the best teachers in the world. His parents were Rhodes Scholars. I mean, we were talking high intellect. He's in the sixth grade, can barely get through a sentence. I am bereft. It's my second year teaching. I really don't know what I'm doing. So, you know, you just do what you do in a situation like that. And, you know, you put try to put out a question. You Fake know, it till you out. make it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so then um, I was... Uh, rolling around in the library, pulled out a book, opened it up, and it was a short story about Nellie Bly, who, as we know, was this just intrepid uh, reporter, and, you know, got herself locked up in an insane institution and everything so she could write a story. So I said, why not? So we took it out, read it, more or less, <laughs> me reading, and um, then we went on interviews we interviewed at our office secretary. We went down to, I got an interview uh, with, with the, with the um, director of the museum, the Ch- Children's Museum downtown. And, you know, we really made an effort. So these kids are, can hardly write, but we're still asking questions and so on, putting them together and had our little interview book. And lo and behold, all of them really started reading by the end of the year. Hmm. But that isn't the real story. But the real story is, um, the boy who I was thinking about the most, who was having the hardest trouble with the written word, who then learned to read, became a documentary filmmaker. Now, I'm not saying he became a documentary filmmaker because in sixth grade he had Miss Oresti who taught him a story about Nellie Bly. What I'm saying is that that child put out the call. And that call was about his destiny and what he was going to be. Mm-hmm. And as an adult who was in his sphere, right. I was smart enough to listen mm-hmm. or my angel hit me over the head with a two by four. Not yeah, sure. it's, that's how it goes for <laughs> me. It's yeah, I'm a slow learner. Through. It's yeah. right there with a the two by four. <laughs> Um, but um, the, the, there is this very strong responsibility to be able to listen to the child's destiny as well. Wow. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's that, you know, that murky and out there. <laughs> and sometimes it's really, really very practical. And I yeah. just, I wanted to um, just speak a little bit about one of the real practical parts of watching and listening. And that is that most people, uh, not most, many people today, a lot of people today have got issues with balance. Now, I'm not talking that they're falling off bicycles or stumbling or anything. It's a very subtle um, challenge. And you can tell about your balance if you stand, for instance, on one foot and close your eyes and see if you can count. 
and a lot of and some people will really wobble a lot. So it's this subtle sense of balance because uh, we get balance from three different areas from our eyes, uh, from our muscles, which tell us how we're standing, and also from the vestibular part of the ear. And it's often this vestibular part, which is um, not working properly. And with all, you know, with all the allergies and things uh, that folk have, this of course gets disturbed here, that fluid in the ear. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens then, and, th and this is really the basis of, of a, a lot of sensory work, what happens is that when a sense isn't working well, especially the sense of balance with its organic process in the ear, the higher area of the brain, which we would call the executive function or the frontal lobe work, and that's, you know, that's your working memory, your decision-making abilities, and so on. The frontal part of the brain then takes over and pays attention to what should be happening in the body naturally. So it gets preoccupied with a bodily function when it should be free for, one might say, intellectual work. Mm. So therefore, you can have a child, let's say in sixth grade, who is understanding the geometry one day, comes back the next day, can't remember anything. You see, they have the intellectual capacity to understand, but the balance is off enough so that the higher cortical area of the brain has to put the body in balance and isn't there for working memory. Fascinating, fascinating. So we do a lot of balance work in the program. So that can be something as fun as for little kids, rolling on the floor, but pausing, remember the important pause, so that the fluid in the ear can balance itself like that carpenter's, um, mm -hmm. what's that called again, carpenter's plane? Yeah. You know, the little ball in it. And, um, and then with older children, you can do um, exercises just as simply as, as standing and then putting your head to your knee, like on the right side, mm -hmm. and then on the left side, and then pausing and again, moving slowly, right. So you have to pause so the fluid can center itself. Left. So there's just very simple movement exercises like that, that actually can come from um, OT or physical therapy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this will, uh, so we say, clear the ear. And that would be extremely therapeutic to do. Awesome. Yeah, and it's interesting. Now, um, well, I was just talking about this the other day with somebody. Um, the high prevalence of children getting ear infections, for instance, really. And I had a girl when I was at the Waldorf school, and this girl, um, her head was always full of phlegm. I mean, this girl, this girl, girl could barely, barely breathe. And Mary and Joel remember this girl. And then they finally figured it out that, and she had an operation on her ear and she and she was you know in a public school she would have been classified as learning disabled or something but she went from 0 to 60 in a few weeks zero all of a sudden she was with the program she was reading at le grade level or even better all of a sudden and where she had just struggled and the reason she not only had could she not hear but she wasn't balanced so what Mary Jo was talking about that the, is that frontal lobe was too busy trying to do other things. Mm -hmm. And what happened, and I noticed this with my own children, um, and this is, I just talked to a doctor about this too, and, and, a, and, a, and a parent, is that it seemed to be that, that children who had been immunized were more prone to getting those kinds of ear infections, which, can, which kind of creates this, you know, it, this rolling effect where it, then it con contributes to uh, other kinds of problems and reading problems and network, balance problems, and, 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 right? And uh, my youngest five, 
not a lot of people can say my youngest five, but my youngest five have not had any immunizations at all. The older four had a couple, and, for, and but the youngest five haven't had any. No ear infections. No ear infections. Yeah, this is a this is a big situation. <laughs> the first one of the first books I read, um, a non Waldorf book, was called Smart but Feeling Dumb, and it was written by a New York psychiatrist whose name escapes me now. Um, but he was working with uh, children in Manhattan very well to do, had a lot of advantages, but they were all doing very poorly in school, even though they scored high intellectually. And he noticed as a psychiatrist in their medical uh, files that they all had uh, car sickness. So uh, he, he gave them all Dramamine for that. And then lo and behold, they began to do much better in school. So he started researching this. And, this, and of course, what the Dramamine does is it helps it with the balance. Mm -hmm. So he actually was one of the first uh, mainstream people who came to this thought that balance was important for functioning in school. And, you know, um, of course, we know from you know, from our, our work with, with Waldorf that, uh, that this nourishing of the senses, of all the senses is highly important in order to get a full human being. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, uh, we're, not, we're not the only ones, especially in this level of development. The problem is people aren't really listening to it that much. Right. The data is out there. It's just not filtering down to the school systems, which makes me very sad. Me too. Uh, I was did listen to a, a short interview as I was driving on PBS, two women who were nominated for Teacher of the Year this year. They were both in kindergarten teachers. And they talked about, you know, play, joy, you know, sharing, movement, physical challenges, and and this and this kind of thing. And I was so happy to hear that on the radio that a lot of other people could hear, mm -hmm. you know, but it hasn't, it hasn't been able to break the, the bonds, shall we say, of, of the wall between kindergarten and the grades, you know, it's like, oh, that's fine for little children to play, but, you know, when they get bigger, no, it's, you know, yeah, that's right. books, sit at that desk for six hours mm -hmm. and you lose so, so much. It's inefficient. And it's inefficient. Yeah. And, and, I, and I have to say, because we're running out of time here, but oh yeah, one of the things that Mary Jo did, and I didn't realize what a gift it was until relatively recently, is in her work when, when we were colleagues at the Waldorf School, is she brought in not only wonderful master teachers, um, I'm thinking of Janet McGavin, for instance, and, uh, but also physicians. You know, uh, she mentioned Ross Rentea and his wife, Andrea. Was that her name? Right. And they were wonderful. And it was wonderful for me to, to work with these people and see their insights about, about the students. And also uh, someone who's become a kind of celebrity un, un, unintendedly, um, Tom Cowan, uh, was our, our school doctor for, for a few years there. Uh, and I learned so much from, from, from those people, you know, about child development, about health, about you know, all the things we've been talking about in this, in, this, in this interview with you, Mary Jo. And I learned so much from you, which, you know, I am eternally grateful. And I didn't, you know, these are the kinds of things that uh, I think when I left Waldorf teaching, I didn't realize they were really part of me. But as we say in the biz, you got into my etheric. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary Jo, for talking to us today. Mary Jo, real pleasure to meet you. We'll have to have oh, you back on. It's real pleasure to meet you, so Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thank this is so much. wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. Uh, we'll see you again, same time, same bat channel, next week.